All right, we are live. Okay, Denise. <laughs> Yay! I haven't spoken to you in so long. This is going to be kind of like a catch up at the same time. <laughs> I know. For those of you who don't know, Jody and I, we've known each other for, oh my God, quite a few years now. We've run retreats together in Bali. Oh. Look, wait, I grabbed a photo because I was going to introduce you. And the only one I could find of us was this one. I don't know if you can see it on the screen. Oh, I don't But I it was us in the pool. It was me, you, and Victoria, and Sophie in the pool at our Bali retreat. It's a oh tragic photo. It's not that good at all. You, you're the only <laughs> one that looks good in it. I don't know what Victoria is doing. We had a great time on those retreats. But, but we've known each other for such a long time. Uh, like not so much like ups and downs of business, but we've known each other pretty much from the starts of our businesses and and the internet like world of online has changed a lot oh since God, we've been so friends. Much. Yeah, totally. I think um so most people who are on here are gonna know who you are, right? So when I was thinking how do I intro you, I thought they're gonna know who you are. People on my list know who you are. People who follow me know who you are. And I've talked about you since back then, right from the start. And so back when I first met you, I hadn't met you in person yet, through Victoria, I was listening to your uh, audio, your free audio that you used to give away on your website. And I remember listening to it and I was driving my car and it was one of those weeks that was really... Uh, it was a quiet week, you know, one of those lows of the highs and lows. And uh, you gave us an exercise to do on that audio. And I remember on that audio, it was, you said, I bet you money comes in by the end of this audio or something like that. And literally within a couple of minutes, my phone pinged and a big sale came through. And I was just driving, just laughing to myself going, okay, this shit works. I need to know more about this. So, yeah, so it's been a long time, but um, also, yeah, it was back, was it your first edition of Lucky Bitch, probably, when I first met you? Yeah, probably, yeah. So I published that in 2011, that first version, and, you know, and like you, we were, we were kind of just both just figuring out, like, what our thing was going to be, but I think both of us back then, even back then, had a really strong vision of, like, entrepreneurship is our thing. Like, mm -hmm. this is what we want to do. We don't want to work for anyone else ever, and we're going to do what it takes, even though, you know, the technology was even very different back then. Yeah. You remember you had to do, like, webinars through fucking instant tele seminar. Yeah. And, <laughs> it was just ooh, all voice. Everything <laughs> yeah. just got so hard. We, we yeah. were making our own graphics all the time, yeah. you know, were figuring out how to do everything. And things like that. It was all straight out and we did the hard I think like things like pick monkey or something were around and you could do tiny little things yourself but at least you knew how to do graphics and that kind of thing but even um uh, even what about videos now I mean so much so much easier than it ever was before just so much technology so many free tools when people go how can I do this on a shoestring budget uh, look around social media everything's available Totally. And I think maybe even you and I used to have the Kodak ZIA. Yes. Oh my God. I still got it. I've kept it. I think it's in my drawer over there. Well, I went to, I was speaking at an event about video on the stage in America last year and I took it with me and the iFlip. Remember the iFlip? Yeah. I took those with me. Uh, and I held them up and I was like, who remembers these? And, Hardly anybody did. Just a couple of really old people who'd been around forever. <laughs> oh, that was you youngins, it's so easy for you now. <laughs> yeah, just grab your phone. So I'll do a little bit of an introduction. So, um, so Denise, if you don't know, she is the author of best-selling book uh, Lucky Bitch, and her new book, which we'll talk about soon, uh, Chillpreneur. Um, you know, I keep going to say uh, Chilenia. You can't say <laughs> that. Don't say it. to me. <laughs> so, uh, and yeah, we met years ago, but I think if people don't know you, the shortest way to describe you would be that you are the absolute master of all masters that everybody knows as the person to remove money blocks. And anyone who is watching, no doubt, if they're part of my crowd, they're the overachievers, big dreamers, overthinkers, 
And they've got money blocks. Part of their overthinking is their money blocks that hold them back. They've got these big dreams. They're not quite hitting it. And so um, I do have some questions, but before we get into it, I want to uh, get you to explain first to people what you describe as money blocks. So a money block is anything that stops you from making money. It could be a negative belief, a story. It could be a belief that you have about yourself. It could be a a negative viewpoint that you have about money, about earning money in general. So I think there's, it's really interesting, right? Most of us have got our own money blocks that we received pretty much from our family. Things that your parents said to you about money. Money doesn't grow on trees. You have to work really hard to make money. And then what I find is that people have cultural money blocks too, depending on what culture they come from or what country they live in. So America, for example, has the work hard thing on steroids because they have to be the best. Yeah, Yeah, it's part of their national identity. So a lot of women then are like, well, I can't make money unless I'm the best, which sets up some really you know, hard things and I have to work really, really hard to make money or, or it doesn't count. In Australia and New Zealand, and I'd love to hear if you think there's a difference in money blocks, but there's a sense of equality and and fairness. That's what we want to do as a society. So it's almost then we feel guilty for doing better than other people in our peer group or of our family or, you know, in society in general. We feel guilty if money comes too easily to us. So that's the whole point of Chillpreneur too is it's like it's, it's allowed to be easy and it's allowed to – to, you're allowed to have a business that suits your personality, but we've got all these blocks that tell us that that's not okay in lots and lots of different ways. So I work purely on that mindset piece because I feel like that's so important. Once you have that, then you can go and do a course, work with somebody, Google how to do something, but without the mindset piece, all of that is going to feel really hard and you'll probably sabotage it. Funny, because this word sabotage is what I've got a list of questions here that people have asked that I've written down, and the word sabotage comes up a lot. So we'll come yes. back to it. Um, I agree with you because having my business in New Zealand, Australia, America, it's definitely a different show. And because the Paul Toppy syndrome is stands stand strong, is super strong down here. And I think um, even just this morning, I was thinking about it. There's um, a particular a potential client who I could get across the line. And I know that there's things that I could say that would get them across the line. And if I was in America, those things would be expected, but they don't sit right with me. They feel salesy, but really I know I can help this person. So it's my own stuff to overcome. It's not like I'm telling them something that's not the truth. I'm actually sitting uh, boundaries and I know that you're brilliant when it comes to boundaries and I think um, maybe we could talk more about that so sometimes uh, the boundaries come into play so there's the like you say New Zealand Australia America they all work quite differently there's being stern and direct and holding your boundaries is a, it's very different like sometimes those things can be confused with being salesy and then having strong boundaries so like this particular sale um, I'm not pushing hard on it because it doesn't feel right. But at the same time, is that my money bullshit coming up? Or is that just, you know, not feeling in alignment, selling that kind of way? Um, I don't know. Sometimes I think it's totally okay for you to sell in a way that works for you. Um, so there's definitely that part of that, that we have this scarcity thinking that if I just say it how it is or tell people what I can offer, I'm not going to get as many clients I have to be everything to everyone so we often just even resist designing our businesses that to suit ourselves and I actually remember working with you when you did one of my websites and I remember looking at your um intake form and it was like I don't work with everybody Mm -hmm. you know like I don't work with anyone this is not a cheap investment and you know why I had to fill this one I was thinking I hope she picks me (laughs) I think that was the one, and that just that's a perfect example. I think I was split testing that form, and I actually put on it because I wanted to weed out people who couldn't afford it. This is not some, I think I said, cheap $2,000 program because I wanted them to know it was more than $2,000 for the investment. 
Um, and I got more applications by adding that one line than I had ever had before. So having those boundaries actually, uh, I felt like it set you up as a leader because if you haven't got that kind of boundary and that, um, what's the word, not dominance, like that leadership, that assertiveness, then, you know, people aren't going to see you as a leader and everything's going to be a bit more fluffier and grey. Exactly. And so you're allowed to do those things in your business when you tell people, here's who I work with and here's who I don't work with. Um, My friend Catherine Hocking does this really well as well. She's like, I can only work with you if you've got a budget, if you've got a team, if you've got this. If you don't have those things... It's not like you're not going to be successful in business, but I personally cannot work with you because it's just not my zone of genius. So I I really appreciate when people do that. And on the other side of it too, I feel so taken care of when someone is really strong on their boundaries and tells me what is and isn't acceptable. And I actually like tried to buy someone's service recently. Oh, my God. And so she did have an intake form on her website, but there was no – like. She called me after that, right? She just called me, and I was like, oh, well, I'm on the phone. I can't. This went on for, like, three days. She called me. I emailed her back and said, look, I I just want to work with you. And she's like, well, no, we need to have a conversation. So we had a conversation, and I was like, great. So I want to work with you. And so she talked at me for 20 minutes telling me all the options, and I was like, yep, I want want the big one. And she just kept on talking, kept on talking, kept on talking. And then I was like, can I just – give you my money and then she's like wait now we have to have a conversation about time zones and I was thinking this could all be automated yeah absolutely this could all be automated and it would have been so quick and I just wanted to give you my money That's and did you give her your money in the end or did it skew yes, off eventually I was like so it's a visa card here's my card number um and well even just that <laughs> alone brings up people's money shit obviously you know if, if someone actually, I remember there was a funnel I built and my offer was like a $30,000 offer to work with me for the year and it was all of this stuff. It was before I, I didn't expect many people to say yes. And this funnel worked so well that in the first couple of weeks, uh, I had 10 people sign up and I went, wow. yay, 300 grand. I ended up having to ditch half of those people and giving them their money back. Because I couldn't, I had given them unlimited access to me. There was no boundaries. I didn't expect them to say yes. But I remember one of the sales calls, there was someone on there offering me the visa and I was just taken back. And I was going, what, what, what are you already sold? You hardly, we've been talking for like 15 minutes. You've just been through a funnel. I've never heard of you in my life. And she wanted to buy. And I was just taken back. It was so out of the ordinary. But when that happened, it did shift my beliefs around money it did shift my perspective so that was an interesting lesson i think everyone does the unlimited email access if you're in a service business i think everyone does that at the start and then you realize that this is that's (laughs) a terrible idea but then what happens is most people they just ditch their business Mm. rather than having a conversation around and setting boundaries around it and i remember when that happened i had to I had a person, she Skyped me and then she Facebook messaged me and she emailed me and then she texted me. She's like, did you get my message? And finally I I had to send her a message and say, hey, just to let you know, unlimited email coaching is not included in your package. Um, And and then I slammed my computer shut and I wanted to throw up for the next 12 hours and and didn't check it. And then she was like, oh, okay, no problem. Another time I realized that my clients were treating me like Google and they'd be like, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? What do you think about this? And finally I said, hey, that's a great question. Let's park that until we have your next session. And they're like, oh, no, I don't want to waste my session time with that. But they were totally happy to waste my time with it because I was training them that I would respond within 10 minutes. Yeah. So those painful things will happen, but you have to be the one to change it. Otherwise, they will continue. And you're such a master of boundaries, so I can imagine that that's part of the reason you are because you know what it feels like when you don't have those tight boundaries and you don't set those expectations i feel like i've I, I i'm always trying to tighten them up i wouldn't say i'm amazing at it it's just that i just really don't like painful things like that happening for too long and i don't want to quit my business and yeah. so for me i have to then just go okay well what's next what's next what, what's the next boundary and for, for everyone listening to you don't have to do it 
in a way that suits someone else's business. You do it in a way that suits your business because you can. There are, there are more than enough clients who will be totally fine to live by your rules. And there will be some who don't, and that's okay too. So I, I go to this restaurant every day, like not every day, sorry, every week for two years, and I always order the same thing. And they recently changed their menu, and I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I was like, but can I – can I add chicken and halloumi onto this? And she goes, oh, no, new. we've got a new chef and he's got new rules. You can't add anything. And so I'm like, okay, that's fine. That's her, I'm not going to go there anymore. That's fine that they have that rule. And I'm not angry because it obviously works for them. And they will find customers who are totally fine with that. But for me, I'm like, okay, I'm out. And that's what will happen. Some of your customers, you want to hang on to all of them and be like, please don't leave me. But you can't live like that. Um, and so it's okay to let some of them go because they'll find someone else and it will be a better win-win for both of you. And nothing will – I said this to someone the other day. You know the only thing that really kills my confidence in my business is people that don't get results from doing my programs or whatever. But never, ever, ever has a person not got results um, because they've done the work. Never, ever. It's always people who buy a program, don't do it, like don't even log in, don't do anything, and then they ask for a refund. But they're not going to, you know, they just don't do the work. That's the only people who have ever wanted a refund or come back. But those ones still throw my uh, confidence, even if you've got, you know, for every one, you've got a thousand people who are singing your praises. For some reason, they're the ones that seem to get your attention and I know that that's such a common thing out there that that kind of you know part of their money blocks is you want to please people you want them to get results but you can lead a horse to water but you can't make them drink that's for sure totally and as a coach or as a service provider you can't want it for them more than they want it for themselves you know and you can see the potential in them and you can see how their life would change and all of those things but you can't want it for them. They have to want it for themselves too, and they have to want it enough to overcome their resistance, which is totally normal, by the way. Um, and yeah, you can't you can't carry that for them. One hundred percent. So I'm going to ask you. Actually, I want to before I ask the questions that people have asked me. Um, Victoria and I had a conversation recently, and we turned it into a show. And that was um, the title of our show was "Money Can't Buy You Happiness and Other Lies." And we went into, we both had completely different views, but we went into the conversation of that phrase, that money can't buy you happiness. And uh, for me, for my view, money is freedom. Money is freedom to do what I want with my family, to, you know, be able to provide. Like last night, my son, they were doing a fundraising for Christchurch. He and his friends were, I was, I had just literally yesterday bought him a new bike because his bike wasn't the right size. They went on this fun run last night and his mates went on their bikes and he ran it. Now, what he didn't realize is they took the adult course because they were on their bikes. So quarter past eight last night, he was with his friends. We couldn't find him. It was dark. He had run nearly eight kilometers alone in the dark. We were had a search party out looking for him. Oh, my God. Uh, all because he didn't have his bike. And I thought... You know, there's a perfect example of money can't buy you happiness. Can you imagine how stressed I was if I had just earlier not worried about the money and just got him the freaking bike sooner instead of thinking, ooh, better be careful with that, last night wouldn't have happened. So if people go money can't buy you happiness, what about bills and the stress of not having money? So what do you say to people when they say money can't buy you happiness other than they don't know where to shop? <laughs> um Money can buy you so much peace of mind, you know. So everyone's got different views about what money could bring for them. But being able to pay your bills just feels so great. Mm -hmm. I asked Sandy Forster one time who writes books about money too, one of my mentors. I said, "When? what was the best thing for you about having money? And she said, oh, I was buying a blender one time. And I remember sitting there and almost crying thinking, I don't have to choose which blender I want. I can choose any regardless of the price mm -hmm. and I'm like that with like tomatoes I'm like oh my god it's so amazing that I can buy yeah. any tomato that I want because my mom I she sometimes um comes to stay with us 
and she'll go, oh, I'll cook dinner tonight. And she'll go buy one onion, one carrot, like the cheapest of everything. And because that's what she had to do as a single mom. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I look at that and just think, oh, thank God I do not have to think about how many carrots I buy. Um, I actually don't have very expensive tastes, but I just love the fact that I do not have to worry about those those things. And also the other thing that for emotionally like rewarding for both Mark and I is that we can support our moms. They don't have to work if they don't want to. Um, that feels really, really amazing. I love being able to donate money to charity. I think we're up to about 45,000 this year already. That feels really freaking good. You can do so much better having money than not having money. Yeah. Absolutely. This is it. Um, okay. Not deserving. That seems to be a common thing that's coming up in the questions. Not deserving. When I asked some people what they wanted me to ask you today, uh, several of them said part of what they feel their money block is is that they don't deserve it and they want to know how can they overcome something like that. Yeah. Well, first of all, really examine what stories you heard as a kid about you have to work really hard to make money because then because we, we grew up in an analog society, even though it's an our digital society, our brains haven't quite caught up with the fact that you can make money online quite easily. It doesn't quite compute with our bodies. So, of course, we don't feel like we deserve it if we just like, Oh, can I really make money from an ebook I wrote five years ago? Can I really make money from a program that I've already created? It doesn't quite gel in our bodies yet. Do you remember that lady on our um, at our Bali retreat? She was an older lady from the UK. She came to our Bali retreat, and she was making like forty five grand or something a month off an ebook on how to build a WordPress site, which you can actually get off YouTube for free. But she had just written the book in a way that talked to her audience. And she was creaming it. Remember her? She was second. Yes. I think her name was Gillian. And that's the thing. And also we second guess like, oh, but people can find this online for free. Everything can be found online for free. But they're buying your expertise, your curation. If you're creating an online program, they're also buying accountability, support, community, um, feedback, mentorship, that's what they're buying. They're not buying the information. You can find that everywhere for free. So this whole thing of deserving, like it's about value for the other person, not necessarily the blood, sweat, and tears that you put into it. So a mantra that I really appreciate for this is I serve, I deserve. I serve, I deserve. Um, and it's from, I don't know if it's backwards. I serve, I deserve. No, is it backwards? Right way. Oh, it's my way. I said, I deserve. Um, my friend Leonie Dawson painted this for me because um, I, I always say it. And so I just have it on my desk now. Whenever I feel guilty, oh, I'm not giving enough to my clients. Oh, is this, wor is this worth it? I remind myself, I serve, I deserve. You can't have the nicest, best people who really care about people in the world earning the least. It just doesn't make sense. There, there's so much money in the world, and unfortunately it's mostly in the hands of people who actually do not deserve it. Mm -hmm. Like They're not doing good things in the world for their money. Um, and most of the people in our communities are really genuinely helping people. Um, and, you know, you deserve to make money from that. And then you can spend your money in ways that also enrich other people. Yes. While you're on the topic of that, then, something that I do hear quite a lot, is people, because they undervalue what they do, they overserve to the detriment of themselves. So not only do they undercharge and overdeliver, they then attract clients who are sometimes pains to deal with, um, who are never happy no matter how much you're overdelivering. And then often I find that those are the clients who are the most unhappy, ask for refunds or discounts or default payments or whatever it's it's the reason why is because you're attracting people who reflect your own self-worth mm -hmm. if you're thinking i don't really deserve this it's never enough you're also attracting clients who are like well i want more from you you know answer my email at three o'clock in the morning what's you know i need you to do this because they're just a mirror i think um the cool thing about that over the years i've seen as well is um Clients who have gone to selling high ticket for the first time and they can't comprehend that someone would pay them that money. And then they have that breakthrough moment where someone pays them that money. 
and they kind of, it's a shock to them. It's kind of like, it's so unexpected, they can't believe it, that the first high ticket sale they make is like someone tripped over and fell on their keyboard and accidentally put their credit card in. And then <laughs> the second one solidifies that new level. And I see it all the time with clients. And I was the same. The first one that came through, I thought, wait, wait, someone's going to pay me that. And I wasn't, it was kind of like when I lost 15 kilos and I was much slimmer, I was still wearing my fat clothes because my brain hadn't caught up to the reality instead of the other way around. And I see that with people raising their prices, putting themselves out there, charging what they're meant to be charging is um, there, there comes a point that it's not like, you know, sometimes you hear that you've got to feel that way first for it to happen. You can do that and work on that, but what I see is, you know, that stuff will happen and it'll still feel like a shock and then you just wiggle into it as well. You do, and you have to acclimatize yeah. to it, which is why often lottery winners lose all their money because they haven't had time to acclimatize to it yeah. and they don't they, they don't know how to hold that wealth. They don't know how to be a rich person. So it's totally okay to do things incrementally, but one thing that you could do, exactly what you did where you put together a VIP offer, so you're like, no one's going to buy this anyway, so why don't I just put a price that I would never dare charge mm -hmm. for a service that I would never think that someone would buy? Right. Just put it on your website and do it because that will help you acclimatize because most of the time someone will buy it and you'll go, oh, it actually is undervalued. <laughs> yeah, and even if they don't, I always say a box is never big nor small until compared to another box. So if you've got a medium-sized offer that you want people to purchase and there's a giant one beside it, it's going to make that one look more achievable for them. So Yes, I saw Andre Chaperon do this with um, his Autoresponder Madness course. I remember it was like an e-course you could get and it was – he had three prices on there, which used to be really popular, right, the three-price block. And it would be – I think it was like 497 for the course or 197 I can't remember how much it was. And then it was like, oh, we can do it for you, and it was like – I don't know, 15,000. And then it was like, oh, you can fly to us and we'll do it face to face over a weekend. And it was like 30 grand or something. And I remember going, well, that's a bargain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And it's a weekend away. You get to be immersed in it. Things just solidify more when you uh, are right there in front of people, too. Yeah, but I don't know if he ever sold one of those. But for me, I was like, well, I'm getting that, you know, at the start of my journey, I'm like, I'm getting that e course one because. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not ready to spend all that kind of money. Whereas it before, if it was just there, I'd probably have been like, mm, I don't know. So who knows? It would have been, you know, maybe a very clever marketing technique, but it worked, totally worked on me. I, one time I had, since you know how they say through a funnel, don't give more than one offer. One time mm -hmm. I tested it where I had an offer that was, mm, it was 15 grand, something like that. It might have been 10 grand. Can't even remember. It might have been 30. Um, and then next to it was a complete done for yourself online version that was about a thousand bucks. And I thought by having that giant one there, people would buy the lower one. I sold one of the lower one and sold a shit ton of the high ticket. So <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's so fascinating. It just proves with funnels, you test and measure and what one person might be preaching is not the truth. And like we we're talking before about setting expectations with clients. I have to be really clear when I'm building funnels for people when they come on board. It's like they say, can you give us an example of numbers? I have to be straight out with them and go, I could and I will if you want to see some numbers. But they're so irrelevant because you're a different offer, a different market, and you're different on video. You're, it's so different. It's not until you actually test things that you know for sure and you just test and tweak and test and tweak until the floodgates open. So it's really weird, you know, going in because you want to go, yes, I can make you a whole bunch of money, but that's just bullshit, especially if it's high ticket because really you're getting them leads and if they can't close, then what can well, you do? Well, exactly, <laughs> which is a great example actually of over-delivering. So Victoria Gibson, our beautiful, beautiful friend, when she started out doing Facebook ads, because she's a multi-talented entrepreneur, she'd go, oh, their landing page is terrible. All right, I'll just fix that for them. Yes. But their copy sucks. Oh, I'll fix that for them. Oh, but their website kind of sucks. Okay, I'll fix that for them too. And so she was ended up trying to fix every single part of their offer 
and it still didn't convert because they they just didn't have the right stuff to do to do it themselves. Yeah. She tried to fix everything, and she was only getting paid for one aspect of it. Yeah, and I remember traveling with her when we were in hotel rooms. Probably one of the first trips I met you actually. Uh, and she was there in the hotel room. We were meant to be networking and doing these things. She may have even been speaking. And she was in the hotel room on her laptop trying to do all of this stuff, getting really stressed, and it was just, you know, so much more than they were paying her for back then. Exactly. Whereas, you know, then when you can you can uh, filter your clients, be really clear on who and you and who you can and can't help. It's so much easier because then you feel like you can win with those clients mm-hmm. instead of taking on everybody at all stages of their journey. And it's okay for you just to go, you know what, I'm only working with someone at this stage of their journey, not everybody, because we've all got different skill sets. I actually could, I don't think I could really coach someone from scratching their business because for me that was eight, nine years ago. I'm not the best person for them. I wouldn't have the empathy where um, I, I remember what that was like at every yeah. stage of that. So it's we've all, there's so many different niches that we can do, but often we try and, help everybody and it doesn't work it doesn't serve them it doesn't serve you and when people are at the start it's not that they can't make money they absolutely can it's just there's literally more work to go from nothing to something than to go from the ship's already moving and then turning it into something else for sure absolutely and you know i see people at the start of their journey and they're like oh but do i have to do this and i'm like if it was easy everyone would do it yes we do falling from the sky Okay, yeah. we need a gift of that of like we can just add just it. Money falling, I'm sure there is. <laughs> okay, next question: How do we stop repeat money sabotage? Great question. The truth is, you will continue to repeat money sabotages unless you acknowledge it and where it came from. So often there is a story attached to that, and there's an origin story. So it's not your boss. It's not your partner. It's usually earlier than that. Um, it's usually pre-seven years old where you've, you've created a story around you, you your ability, your ability to, um, to do things or anything even about money. So a lot, of, um, a lot of us kids, our very first interaction with money is don't put that in your mouth. Money is dirty. Dirty. Very first interaction with money. And then we hear other things too. We hear our families bitch and talk about money. Or you might have even heard stories about rich people or poor people um, that your family said, oh, you know, that person, she's she's raking it in. She's just so, so evil. She's an evil, you know, an evil rich bitch. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so until you really see all that stuff and see why you're sabotaging yourself, it will continue. It will continue forever. So acknowledgement is half the work it really is and then you can realize in the moment oh i'm doing this because of that thing i i then like to replace that negative thought with a positive thought and this is why i love affirmations i think you can very easily add something in there as a pattern interrupter to be like no i serve i deserve instead of thinking well artists never make money or you know i'm making money off the back of people that's not you talking that's old old Mm. stories and old stuff talking um and then yeah you have to be accountable to that so you can hire a coach to help you with that particular sabotage or you can just have that pattern interrupter i serve i deserve you know something that's there like nope that's that's not gonna happen another thing that will help you um to stop the sabotage is to really get clear on what it's costing you and instead replacing that with um, your dream life, you know, let yourself be pulled towards your dream life, knowing that those sabotages are in the way and just, you have to just let them go. Otherwise it's not, it's not going to happen. What's interesting is the invisible money blocks, you know, like, um, I talked with my, I talked with an energy healer recently and I talked about like, if I have zero, zero doubt in my mind, like, absolutely no doubt in my mind about my next level and that it's going to come whenever that is it's going to come I have zero doubt in that I don't know when it is it may you know it may be next week it may be next year but whatever that next level is but if it's not here yet you think there's invisible blocks so you can think back to there's the obvious sabotage sabotage points that you remember when you were young but there's those invisible ones that you haven't quite got to yet and uh, 
Yeah. It's how do you even get to those ones? You know that there's blocks, but you don't know what they are. Yes. So often there's something symbolic about the income that you're stuck at. So a couple of things that I ask people to do is what's symbolic about this income as in who earns this income? So I got stuck at 120 because I knew that my uncle earned 150 and he was the richest person in the family. And I realized that I had a belief that I would emasculate him or take his rightful place as the richest person in the family because he loves being generous. And I was like, I will upset the order of things. That's an invisible money block, right? You have to just go, what's symbolic about this? Oftentimes, too, um, women are stuck at tax brackets and they don't realize. Uh-huh. Yeah, so that's that's a symbolism thing. You go, oh, I'm, I have to then go to the next tax bracket. What does that mean for me? Um, sometimes in Australia, you know how we have to pay, G- we have to start charging GST. Mm-hmm. That's that's a block where people go, I don't want to charge no, GST, so I'm going to keep yeah. myself. Yeah. yeah. So there's always something symbolic about it. Um, or it could be that you have a belief about what it's going to cost you to earn more money. For women, it's often we fear it's going to say something about us as mums or as girlfriends or wives or it's going to cost our health or it's going to cost our integrity in some way. Mm-hmm. So there's always something symbolic about it, and there's always a fear of what that means. And and we focus more on when we're stuck at that, we're focusing more on the potential problems than we are about what that would mean in a, in a positive sense. So, yeah, it just takes a little bit more, like a little bit more digging. Last week I was at a, an event and she was – it was um, Kat Howe, and she was talking about how she went from $1 million to $10 million and the mindset shift she had to go through to do that. And what I loved, because I could totally relate, but I'd never put a word on it, was normalizing. She had to normalize $10 million. So Wow. It seemed, um, you know, when I listen to Abraham Hicks and someone goes, I want to win the lottery, and they go, yeah, but let's say you want to win a $1 million or $5 million, yet your mindset is here. That's too big a jump. Like there's got to be the in-betweens. And with the visualization and like she was going and uh, test driving fancy cars and going to open homes of nice houses that she wanted, that was how she normalized the 10,000. And I totally relate because there's times where like she said she got into her car and it felt like it wasn't her car because she was so used to driving the nice ones that it didn't feel normal. And I thought that's really cool. She had normalized to her next level. And I love that. I go to open homes of the most beautiful houses all the time. And I walk in there like, it's my house. Like, I can see all my stuff. Yes. Well, I've been doing that for years. And uh, when I tell people to go do that, they're like, but I'm not in the market. I'm going, yes, you are. You have no idea. You you are in the market. It's just the money isn't necessarily there yet. But if you don't believe that that is even a possibility for you, that you can even go to a free open house, Mm -hmm. that's not showing any kind of faith to the universe that you actually believe on a very deep level that that is for you. It's free to go look and you still can't allow yourself to do it. Oh, I've got a good one then. I was with a friend last week. I'm not going to say her name because I know she's listening. Uh, She might not want me to. We, (laughs) um, she wanted to test drive a Maserati. And we, she was taking me to a meeting and we drove past it and the Maserati shop was there and we understand there's a process you've got to go through. But she was didn't have the guts to do it. And I asked my man, I was like, if you wanted to go drive a Maserati, would you have the balls to just go up and go through the process? And he was like, yeah. And so we were going, what is it? It seemed to be more of a female thing as well. Why, why not? Why not fill out the form and go test drive one? You know, because, you know, what was the stuff that came up? And we had, we couldn't quite nail what that block was, but it's one that you hear all the time. Patty saying, say my name. Okay, it was Patty. Patty Patty's on here. <laughs> I get it. I totally get it. And when you were saying that, so we made um, $2.8 million last year, right? And when you said the $10 million, I was like, yeah, actually, I know that I have to do some more mindset work around being able to hold $10 million. And we're actually building a beach house at the moment. And it will be about, um, by the time we've built it in the land, it will be about a $7 million house. And we live in a like $1 million house at the moment while we're waiting for that to be built. And I can feel the, like, in myself going, 
am I ready to move to that $7 million house? You know, like I was saying to Mark yesterday, I was like, I'm going to be really sad to leave this house. But I know that that's where I need to be if I do want to make, say, $10 million and in a way that is still a entrepreneur way. So I've still got some blocks around that, mm-hmm. around can I do it at $10 million but still be a entrepreneur? Yeah. You know, yeah. each level you're totally going to hit the same stuff. And it's like, oh, am I allowed to do this? And is it allowed to be easy? And your offers yeah. are leveraged, so why not? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But yeah. in my mind, I'm like, oh, but then I'm going to have to do this and I have to have more staff and maybe I have to do this. So you have to look at all the negative consequences first and let all of those go. But I remember maybe, God, it was three years ago, I went to an Ali Brown event. And I think at that stage I was maybe at the million-dollar mark and I remember thinking, I can't make any more money than this because I'd have to, you know, work so much harder and have to have a bigger team. And she was talking about how she let go of all her team. And she had just had like two part timers, and she was like, I just have one offer, and it's so easy. And I just went, oh, permission. Mm. And the, and then you know, it was pretty easy then to go from kind of one to three million. But I, every stage, I'm like, oh, well, then you need to examine your beliefs again. It's not like money mindset you get like a vaccine for it yeah yeah it's constant you have to just come up you know you'll get to a comfort zone i'm pretty comfortable about earning around three million dollars now but it's like oh well then what's the what's the next level of that and you actually think that maybe there's advanced strategies i still have to do the same strategies that i teach in my money boot camp i don't have advanced strategies Mm -hmm. it's the same work but you're in a different place and it's like the muscle you got to keep working it what i liked about what she said last week was I think she said it took three years to get from uh, 80000 in revenue to a million in revenue. And then I think it was like a fraction, I think did she say a year or something else, to go from $1 million to $10 million. Wow. What's like her name? I need to look her up. A fraction of the time. Cat Howe. So she does Facebook ads. Cat Howe. That's amazing. Yeah. But, yeah, exactly. My my business is leverage. There's no reason why I couldn't make $10 million. But I think the reason, too, is – um. We think we've got these goals in our head, but until you write them down, it's not a thing. And I realize I haven't been writing down my next income goal. I've been kind of coasting. And that's you'll just get coasting results back if you don't write it down, that next thing. And I know this is totally true because I started writing down last year that I wanted to buy a holiday house. And (laughs) I bought a rose farm just like a couple couple months after writing that down because I committed it to paper and then – and it appeared. I was like, oh, but I didn't mean now. And it was like, well, you wrote it down. Yeah, but you also took that and turned it into a revenue-generating investment as well, didn't you? Because you're going to do weddings yeah. now, yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. But I just find there's so much magic in writing stuff down. And yeah. I, it's funny that we're talking about this now because I was thinking $10 million would be like – would be great, but I haven't written it down anyway. So thank yeah. you, Jody. I'm going to go change all my passwords <laughs> um, because we have to, as you said, normalize it. And yeah. I always say to people, um, make your password your next income goal because even the act of writing it down or typing it in all yep. the time starts to normalize it for you. So I'm going to go put $10 million You on told all me my that passwords. years ago and to this day my passwords are all still my goal. So whenever yeah, my your team next go, one, yeah. oh, I wonder what Jody's password is, and I go, the usual, and then try it, it always works. <laughs> um, actually, you just uncovered one of my invisible blocks as well because I have, it's funny, I've had a blank sheet of card on my wall to redo my um, vision board, which is essentially the visual of my goals that I look at every day, uh, and it's been blank on my wall for months now but I just this week started putting some things onto it and it just lifts you because it's just it just makes it more real so um but yeah you just totally hit on one of my invisible ones I didn't realize it was there and that is if I go to the next level I'll have to work harder I'm okay with having some team and that kind of thing building my team I can you know that's cool um but will I have to work harder and I think that hustle instead of flow mentality that we're taught, you know, that masculine energy if you got to hustle and get shit done, and which is my, you, you know, I do get shit done more when I'm in my masculine, but to the point where, you know, burnout. Like today, to be honest, I've been so flat today because that stuff happened with Joey last night and I was so freaked out that something had happened to him. 
I was fine right up to the point and I went to bed last night and I just fell to pieces going, oh my God. So today I haven't wanted to work. All I want to do is go pick my kids up school from, from school early and go and hug them and not hustle, you know? So it's kind of like, and I don't know if that's a woman thing as well. Like, um, I, I must have this belief, like you said, that you've got to hustle and work harder if you want to go to that next level. And that's not necessarily true at all. No, it's not. I wish this was a nicer word, but I like to say chussle, chilled hustle. Because chussle, it's so ugly as a word. But you and I both know business doesn't happen just by accident. But there is still ways where we can make it easier. And a perfect example of this is Marie Folio. You know, she's had 50,000 people go through B-School. One program she runs once a year. And whenever I feel like, oh, everyone's seen my stuff, everyone's seen my boot camp, I just think, uh, no, you've had like 6,000 people go through it. There's still a ton of people who need that work. So I tell myself I'm allowed to quit um, my money boot camp when I've had more people than B-School. Um, so I'll be chasing Marie for a while. But, but again, like she's... Um, this year, you know, she's been running it for 10 years, right? Wow. And you think, yeah, she's been running it for 10 years. And this year, I mean, there's about 5,000 people in the new group. So, and not everyone joins the group. So there's probably six, 7,000 people that joined B-School this year. That is insane. That's, I had this exact discussion yesterday with one of my team members because she was asking what my offer is. And I, and I said, oh no, we made that offer the other week. And she went, ah, oh, so? And I'm thinking, oh yeah. That's okay. It's still exactly. relevant to people who haven't done it yet. So, and it's just so much happens for people now. You see so many offers. Like, oh, I've been talking about something forever, and then someone's like, oh, you do that? And I'm like, yeah. You think everyone sees everything, mm. and they don't. And you know, I'm going on tour at the moment, and I still every day someone goes, oh, you're going on tour, and I'm like. Yeah, I talk about it every day. And I know once I've done the tour, there'll be people who go, oh, I didn't know you were on tour. I missed out. So you just you have to just be really, like, just telling people about your stuff all the time. All the time. Okay, so before I want to – I want to ask you about your new book and talk about your tour, but I just want to ask – oh, here's a question. <laughs> here's what I prepared earlier. Here's a question um, – yeah, this is the last question, and then we'll talk about your tour. Where to invest your money? So you know you need to invest money into your business, but there's debt and family expenses and things like that, the everyday costs that you've got to cover as well. So how do you know where to invest your money, and how do you do that with confidence? Yes, yeah, so I think in my early days I was pretty shit at this, to be honest, because I was like, oh, a mastermind, that sounds like yeah. fun, $18,000, no problem. Um, but then I was like, oh, I can't hire an assistant, that's too expensive. Yeah. Like, I can't hire a VA for four hours a week, that's $100 a week, no way. Um, so I was terrible about this my first year. What I think is really important now is to really look at what you want to offer what those price points are and how long it would take you to create it. Um, and then who can you hire to help you implement those? Mm -hmm. So a great example is an online course, right? You and I both know people who have been working on their online course for fucking five years, right? And it's like just hire somebody to to do it for you, to help you with it. Yeah. Hire a videographer oh, so yes. that you have to write the script yes, and then they'll deliver the video. Sometimes Hire it takes five years, it. and I hear this all the time, because it's not in their genius and their flow to create a bunch of slides and record the screen, yet they can get on a stage and blow away the audience. So the best place for them to invest is get your ass on a stage, get a bunch of people in the room, even if they're your mates, as long as you've got an audience, if that's how we view and flow, and pay somebody to video it, and there's your program. There it is. I think so many entrepreneurs feel like they have to be good at all aspects of it, and I hear people go, well, I just need to finish stuff off, and I'm like, you hire finishers. Yeah, or they get inspired by someone like yourself or Marie Folio, and then they go and try and create it the same way, but that's not in their flow. And it doesn't work. It goes against the grain. So they're doing it. Absolutely. Way. So that's how you do it. You really look at what do I want to create and who can I help to help me create it. And But be smart about those things. So some people go, oh, I just want to finish my book. And I go, books are great. Books are wonderful. But they're not your moneymaker. 
you know, like, and they I'm telling time. people, no, exactly. They, this took freaking like two years, right? Mm-hmm. And I make a dollar a book. Mm-hmm. Whereas I, I recorded my last um, money boot camp. I recorded like two, I do it every two years or so, right? Um, it took me a weekend and I sell it for $2,000 at a time. And, you know, we have 6,000 people who have bought that program. So you've got to also be smart about the return on investment. Not every project is worthy of the same attention. Just yet, absolutely put a book on your to-do list, but your book isn't going to be the thing that makes you a million dollars. Bump it down the list. It's just a, it's a great marketing strategy, but it takes a lot longer. So I want to know, this was my question. Um, I've just downloaded on uh, Audible the book. So I want to know the difference between your chill, your new book, Chillpreneur, chill, it's a mouthful, Chillpreneur. <laughs> and Lucky Bitch. What's the difference? Yes. Yeah, so for I love business. You know this about me, right? I love talking about marketing. I've actually got a marketing degree that's super useless <laughs> compared to what I've learned myself. Um, but I really wanted to talk about business, but in my books, I I was focused on money for those. And so I really wanted something where I could help people understand my philosophy about being in business because people would ask me for business advice and I'd go, it depends. And they'd be like, well, just tell me what you did. And I'd go, but I have a very different personality than you. Mm. So there's no point me telling you how I did things because I need to know more about you. So I realized that the time was right for writing this book because the message is you have to know yourself to prosper and you have to design your business your way based on your rules, not mine. So it just came at a perfect time where I realized that I still wanted to share my business knowledge, but I had more tools to be able to help people understand what made them tick. Mm -hmm. I love it. So you got your tour coming up. and I do. Uh, by the way how weird is this cover i don't like this cover very much by the way but it's like it's not me why why did you choose it (laughs) i didn't choose it (laughs) my publisher really liked it but that's just a little bit of inside goss i'm like who is that person (laughs) (laughs) so i'm going to just put up on the screen while we talk about it because i've prepared the graphic with the tour Cities. Oh my gosh, brilliant. So, I think we might have added a few cities since since then too. So um, Newcastle, Central Coast, Wollongong, Sydney, Canberra, Adelaide, Darwin, Gold Coast, Brizzy. Oh, you just gave me this yesterday, so it might be the up-to-date one. Byron oh, um, I think we're also we're going to add in Townsville because someone's, um, someone's actually just – I'm just going to speak at her conference and we've added in Wellington as well. I can't oh, remember Wellington cool. okay. Okay. Yep, and that's someone else's conference too. So, you know, uh, some people are like, come here, come here. I'm like, I'm available for hire. You know, grab some people and stick me yeah. around. I will I will come to you. Um, and what's going to be really fun about the tour, I'm such a freaking genius, Jodie, because I used to never like doing speaking because I felt like I had to be perfect. And I'm like, oh, I have to lose weight first. I have oh, to do all this stuff. One. But I've, read the, I've written this book all about doing things really easy and chill. So it doesn't matter how chill I am because I can just be like, well, if I'm imperfect, maybe you can do it and be imperfect as well. I think that's so, a much better way to do things. I talk about pedestal coaching. If someone's teaching from a pedestal, then they sit back and do nothing and go, well, it's all right for you. You're up there. Whereas if you can be honest exactly. and open about it, people will resonate more and think, well, if you can do it, I can do it. Exactly, and most of the venues are cinemas, so we're doing it through event cinemas because they've got cinemas everywhere, so we only have to deal with one company. They're during the day when I love to work. My tour wardrobe is like jumpsuits that kind of look like pajamas. I'm so excited to embody and to role model ease in your business and um yeah so it's going to be really fun really casual q a people can ask me anything there'll be books available to to, um to buy we can bring your book and i'll sign it it's just going to be super fun i'm really looking forward to it awesome i've got on the screen right now it's in the link below this video anyway but i've just got on the screen the actual url for the tour so Mm -hmm. denise dt dt dot com forward slash tour is on the screen now so people can go and visit that and get an update on the latest cities as well. Yay! And it kicks off next week, so it's really soon. Um, Newcastle is first up, and then Central Coast, then Wollongong, then Sydney. 
And I'm actually from the Central Coast, and that's going to be the smallest one so far. <laughs> and I'm like, I think there's going to be literally like 20 people there. So if anyone knows anyone on the Central Coast, tell them to get their butt. To, yeah. um, you don't know about relatives that can spread the word. <laughs> I don't even care. It would be so much fun even with 20 people. That's but I think we've sold about five, 600 tickets across, um, across all the cities. So there's still time to buy your tickets. But, yeah, that Central Coast peeps are going to love you up. It's going to be like a one-to-one mastermind yeah, conversation. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's going to be really fun. Awesome. You were talking before, I wanted to share, you were talking before about um, things with ease. And we're, before we jumped on, we are talking about active wear and what have you. And you and I had that conversation about trying to get wigs that looked like our actual hair to use for filming and the magnetic eyelashes as well. <laughs> I've got the little ones on the ends that work, but I've got the three. I cannot get them to work. They so. cannot freaking work. I think I've got some on my desk somewhere, but, you know, I um, I don't have any makeup on today, but sometimes before I jump on a video, I'll do, like, Instagram-worthy makeup where I just, like, smear it all on. I just do it with my hands. <sighs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You just smear it on. And, and it looks fine for Zoom. It looks fine for Facebook Lives. But then you go out into the real world and people are like, you haven't blended your foundation yeah. at all. It's like... It's not for you and for real life. It's yeah. for my online life. Well, I do the front of my hair, but I don't do the back. Like right now, it's probably just a big matted mess at the back. Yeah, but sure I wanted we're to... both wearing yoga pants. Yeah, like... I've got yoga p- pants on underneath. I wanted to share. You might not be able to see it, but the wig. Oh, oh my god, god, that wig it. was not good. <laughs> oh, I didn't do it. Damn it! Oh, it was classic. I'm going to put it in the comments below. Because I used to have a ponytail one. It wasn't a full wig. It was a ponytail. So I'd stick it on and then it would kind of frame my face really beautifully. Um, and then I just thought, oh, yeah, getting a wig would be so great. Oh, and it seems like a good idea, but it doesn't turn out and that just, way. And, but now we'll have apps soon where you can just don't even have to wear makeup and it will just be fine for uh, you. There already is. My daughter found them. There is one, and you choose your makeup, and it's video, and you can move around, and it follows your face, and it looks real. It's so good. That it's is so good. crazy. And the makeup on it's a little bit too wild, so it's kind of like. See, guys, in the olden days when Jodie and I started <laughs> yeah. our business, we were doing the hard way and put our makeup on, on our face. <laughs> exactly. And now, yes, you don't even know how good you have it, which I, I guess is it's the final chapter of the book, actually, where I talk about. What would your grandma have done with your opportunities? And I know my grandma, Judy, you know, she really struggled with independence because she didn't have financial independence. She was a very creative person and she didn't have the time and space to do it because she had four kids and an unsupportive husband and no money of her own. You know, she worked a little bit. And so, yes, it's uncomfortable doing some of this work. Yes, you have fears. But bloody hell, compared to our grandmas, like, they would have jumped on. Like, Mm. my nan might have had an Etsy, you know, an Etsy shop, or she might have been a really great, like, Facebook Live person making her, Uh, you know, spaghetti bolognese recipe, which was amazing, and pan ham soup. I'm like, I wish she had put that in a freaking YouTube video. I'd pay a million dollars for that now. (laughs) I'm learning now that my Croatian side of the family, they were just all so entrepreneurial, and then – um. My nana died when we were young, but there's a the, a video that they created about all their life, and she was a killer, man. So if she had access to the shit we've got now, she would be blowing it up. She would be going Exactly. Up. So anytime you feel scared, think about sitting down with your grandma and saying, yes, I know I have all this opportunity to create freedom, adventure, abundance for our family, but what if I get a hater on YouTube? Like, what would, you, what would you say to that? She'd be like, what the fuck? Let's just do it. Who and that's what I meant before as well. Like, sometimes we just, sometimes we spend so much time trying to work out what's wrong with us, what are my money blocks, that you spend so much time doing it that you're not taking any action. And we overthink things. Like, that grandma example is perfect because if I had asked my nana, she would have just gone hard on the fuck up and just get shit done. <laughs> Exactly. Go get that money. Go yeah. get that financial Just independence. My brother says, <laughs> he gave me a big pep talk when I was going to a big speaking gig last year. And as he left, he just said to me, less thinking, just do. And he walked off. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, sometimes that is it. Sometimes we Go just overcomplicate the shit out of it. Exactly. Well, I want to thank you because I really got, I got that 10 million thing 
so clearly from that of like, yeah. oh, I've been playing too small and I've got a money block about it. So thank you so much. That's that. And you know what? She's an sure. American girl, but she's living in Auckland. And I used to have my thing about being stuck down here in little old New Zealand. And she's just killed all of that. So everyone was, wants to go to New Zealand these days. Yeah. Freaking billionaires are buying up bits of land. That's right. <laughs> So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's going to be so fun to actually catch up with you in real life for once when we see you on this tour. So I'm going to be at hopefully the Auckland one, but definitely the Gold Coast one. So I'll be sure. And if Patty's still watching, she's got an awesome Gold Coast Coast crew and she's the networker from hell. So she'll be Oh, she'll yes. It will be awesome to see you. And I'm going to go stay at that really um, nice, is it called the Carlisle or the Carlisle Hotel or something in Brisbane? Oh. I'm going to go see that because it looks really fabulous. I'll send you the link for it, Jodie, because I think you'd love yeah, it. Yeah, be an amazing I filming location. to a comedian up in Brisbane, and I was looking at accommodation yesterday where we were going to stay. Oh. hope it's near it's, South Bank. It's amazing. I'll send that to you. It's not at South Bank, I don't think, but it's it's very, very cool. So I will see you there. I will see all of the um, all of you guys watching. I'll see you at, at on the tour as well. Awesome. Thanks so Chill much. Chill and prosper. It's chill and prosper. <laughs> love it. <laughs> See you later. Bye. And...